Well, good e evening, everyone. My name is Lee Paddock. I'm the Associate Dean for the Energy and Environmental Law Program at George Washington University. I'm uh, here primarily to welcome you uh, tonight to the lecture. Um, we are launching this year uh, with this event, our 50th anniversary celebration, which is going to continue throughout the next year. Um, there are a number of events coming up. Uh, in March, we're doing a natural resource conference uh, on March 12th. On March 27th, we are bringing back uh, GW Law graduates who teach energy and environmental law in, around the country seven of our graduates who will um, speak about the future direction of energy and environmental law in their particular areas of interest. In June, our annual alumni event on, I think, June 4th, uh, we'll have a special event on the Potomac River with Nancy Stoner of the Potomac River Keeper Network to talk about water quality in Washington, D.C. And then next October, a year from now, we'll culminate our celebration with a three-day symposium, one day focusing on climate and natural resources, one day on environment and climate, and the, the third day on energy and climate. 50 years ago, the Ford Foundation saw a need to enhance environmental law programs around the country and uh, they provided uh, seed money funding for uh, UC Berkeley, for UCLA, for Colorado and Michigan, and George Washington University to enhance their environmental law programs. So uh, we're also recognizing the Ford Foundation for its role in uh, really kicking our program off 50 years ago. That funding brought Arnold Reitze to uh, George Washington Law School. Arnold spent 37 and a half years running that program uh, here at GW. Uh, he's now out in Utah, uh, but Arnold uh, built the program here at GW. Uh, 13 ha uh, years ago, or about 12 and a half years ago, I came to GW, and I've been the associate dean for the program since that time. So together, the two of us have shepherded this program for 50 years. Now, it's interesting that when we planned this event several months ago, we didn't really think about what kind of competition. We didn't want to hold it on Halloween, but we weren't expecting that the competition we would have tonight would be the seventh game of the World Series. We are pleased, though, that um, we'll complete the program tonight a few minutes before 8 o'clock so we can all <laughs> finish the fight. So hang with us. Uh, I think you'll find this a, a very interesting program. Uh, and I now want to introduce my successor at GW uh, Law, uh, the uh, director of the Environment and Energy Program, Lynn Harmon Walker. Thank you, Lee. Welcome, everybody. I am thrilled to be here. And I just want to say a few notes about tonight's uh, program. We'll start with a lecture by our very esteemed guest, uh, William K. Riley. And after the lecture, uh, Mr. Riley will be joined by our wonderful environmental and energy faculty members, um, Professor Robert Glicksman and Senior Associate Dean Emily Hammond. And I want to, um, especially for the uh, online folks, just let you know that we will um, also have a recording of this live stream that you are watching uh, after the end of the program. Uh, we would ask that everybody in the audience please silence your cell phones at this point. Um, and during the uh, conversation that follows the lecture uh, up here uh, with professors Glicksman and Hammond, uh, we will also have an opportunity for those of you in the audience to write down any questions you have.
for Mr. Riley on the note cards and we'll have students going up and down the aisles to collect those. So if you need a note card and a pen, uh, please go back up to the registration table and get, and get one. So it's now my pleasure to introduce you to Bill Riley. Um, his theme tonight is Can Americans Still Do Big Things? Mr. Riley is no stranger to doing big things. He has served under four U.S. presidents, um, and America truly did big things in his tenure at EPA when he was the administrator there in the George W. Bush administration, coming into office at a time uh, where there had been a 10-year deadlock over renewing the Clean Air Act. Um, he pushed through the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments, which mandated massive decreases in uh, the gas emissions that contributed to acid rain, which was a big problem at that time. He increased the regulation of toxic pollutants. He set deadlines for non-compliant areas who had been non-compliant for far too long. And he phased out three major chemical contributors to the ozone layer depletion. He also directed EPA to um, do research on greenhouse gas reductions, and he led the U.S. delegation to the 1992 Earth Summit in Rio, which resulted in the U.N. Framework Convention on Climate Change. Um, he had a career both before and after EPA in multiple sectors. He has worked in the public sector, the private sector, nonprofits. Um, after his service in EEA, he went back to his previous position as president of the World Wildlife Fund. And in, since then, he has engaged in many more initiatives. Um, he also served um, as a leader in the Deepwater Horizon oil spill investigation and uh, cleanup. So I, if I were to tell you about his full career, it would take the rest of our time. So without further ado, I welcome Bill Riley as our first speaker in the Environmental and Energy Law Program's 50th anniversary year of looking back and thinking ahead. Thank you very much. Well, I want to reassure you, I don't intend to speak much beyond the fifth inning tonight, so <laughs> not, not to worry. I have um, spent some time in schools in uh, the period since I left EPA especially, and one just came to me as I was sitting there, and I don't know whether it's anybody in the audience who brought it to mind. But I was asked to give three lectures in engineering at Stanford. And I remember saying to the dean, I know nothing about engineering. And he said, well, you set waste standards. That's very important to us. OK. So I got there to the lecture. And among the students coming in, and they don't talk about their ideas or their courses. That's not chic at Stanford. They talk about what they did on the weekend. And there was this young woman, a slender young woman, wearing a halter top, short shorts, and rollerblades. And I thought, oh, you know, I've never seen that before in an East Coast school. And when I finished my lecture and I opened it up to questions, she had her hand up. And so I thought this has got to be interesting. So I called on her. And uh, she said, is it true that you set the standard for premature death averted at cost, at uh, justifiable cost in a regulation at $1 million? I said, yes. Sorry to get a little wary. And uh, she said, then how do you justify the cost, which was 12.4? million dollars per death averted. And I said, I did that. <laughs> and everybody laughed. And I said, well, I can tell you why I might have done that, because asbestos is not like an ordinary uh, pesticide, which evanesces in the atmosphere and it dis disappears finally. And ever after that, I, I had renewed respect for the students and for the kinds of things that they would teach me and that, uh, that I wouldn't necessarily teach them. And I went back and I told this story to the former president of Stanford, Donald Kennedy. And he said, uh, well, you know, we have this concept of the ducks at Stanford that uh, they're cruising along the surface calmly. They never want to let you know they broke a sweat. But underneath, and you can't see, they're peddling madly. Anyway, I um, look back, because this is a law school, at my own decision to go there. I thought about some of the things that I nearly did. I, at one point, flirted with going on in history. And I was quite taken by architecture. We had a professor who was very charismatic. And 
I remember he used to stand on a podium a little bit like this, a wooden one with a big pole, and he would bang it when, the, when he wanted to change the slide. And he was talking about Mies van der Rohe and 999 Lakeshore Drive in Chicago, and he was rhapsodizing about how beautiful this architecture was. And a young man about my own age, a freshman, stood up and, and put his hand up and said, sir, I, I live in 999 Lakeshore Drive, and twice in the last five years we've had to move out because water got into the walls. And um, Scully, totally assured, said, um, functionality is irrelevant to great art. <laughs> and I remember thinking, I would like to be famous enough someday and respected enough to be able to say something like that. <laughs> Not that it was true. I also, I also admired Frank Lloyd Wright. There's a, his encounter with the law once as an expert witness, he was asked to identify himself. He said, I am Frank Lloyd Wright, world's greatest living architect. And the counselor said, well, I'm not particularly modest, are we? He said, I remind you, counselor, I'm under oath here. <laughs> well. I found myself at law school during the Great Society. It was a time of tremendous promise, excitement, model cities, urban development, uh, the um, expenditure of significant amounts of money, the, the social and racial programs of the Justice of the uh, Johnson administration. I had a professor, Mark DeWolf Howe, who taught constitutional law. His concept of the role of the states was remarkably small. He essentially viewed them as contractors for the federal government. And that was the philosophy that pretty much that, that he used at least to justify the tremendous expansion of federal powers during that period. And I've often thought that he would be delighted to see that a federal law had the effect of causing every, every curb corner and the curb cut in the country to be made in cities large and small. The, um, courses that we were offered did not include environmental law. And I'm reminded once again of the significance of philanthropy that, um, that the Ford Foundation was so prescient. And they not only contributed to schools, they helped create the Natural Resources Defense Council and funded it and the Environmental Defense Fund, Union of Concerned Scientists. And so that list grows places that have been enormously important and effective in the environmental rally that then followed. I um, finished law school where I had written my law school thesis on land reform in Chile. And uh, I'd also contributed to a book on agricultural land and inheritance and how a land passed and could be reassembled in France. I was a Francophile, one of the few that I knew. and. Um, I took two bar courses the summer after my graduation. I don't recommend that. I arrived in Chicago having completed a mass bar, and um, I was six weeks late for a 10-week bar course. So I discovered in the first of the classes that I couldn't stay in the class. I had to go home and work in the hotel. And I also had a job. I, they, the job they gave me had a lot to do with my decision not to go on in law practice, and that was in utilities law. I had gone there as a land use lawyer, and they were very good at that, but I hadn't got there in time to, uh, to get that assignment. But anyway, um, I uh, learned things in law school that have served me enormously well, and I made the decision somewhat uncertainly and without any specific ambition, except as things developed, I thought I might like to be a, a criminal lawyer. And I then went straight from seven or eight months of law practice in Chicago into the Army, the infantry school, and was uh, given orders to go to Vietnam when they were done, to intelligence courses in the infantry school. And uh, at the last moment, I was transferred. My orders were changed to Paris. I remember I didn't believe them at the time. A sadist who was in charge of personnel at the Pentagon, I questioned whether he was really serious. And I said, nobody goes to Paris. And he said, no, that's true. But he said, de Gaulle has given us 90 days to get our forces out of France. This announcement, by the way, when it was made to President de Gaulle to Secretary of State Dean Rusk in the Kennedy administration, Rusk is supposed to have responded by saying, does that include the dead ones, sir? So I thought, uh, I know nothing else about Dean Rusk, really, but I know that that was a good rejoinder. At any rate, so I was given a job and told I didn't have to take it because it would ruin a military career if I wanted one. <clears throat> 
I would be reassigning senior officers and getting us out of intelligence activities in, in France. And I was offered uh, a chance to go home and get married when it was over and, and um, uh, reassignment to Munich and some other nice things, German language school, which I, all of which I took up. But uh, I, I reflect as I look back on the 50 years how very important the draft was to us and how important Vietnam was in general to my generation and to those of some of you at least here. It, um, I, I recall the day that I, that I got my orders changed from, uh, from Vietnam to, to France and I didn't actually get to go to France because de Gaulle wouldn't even allow that. I went to Frankfurt, Germany and, and worked on the French problems from there. I went up to uh, tell my, my girlfriend that I was um, going to um, Europe and she said, that means we can get married. And I remember thinking, well, I hadn't quite got there. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so she said, let's go in and tell my parents. And I said, well, let's, let's walk around the circle uh, first. And, and so we then did go inside, and her father produced a bottle of chill champagne. It was not the sort of household. He was a, he was a, a psychology professor, chairman of the psychology department. Uh, he, he didn't have chill champagne. I remember thinking, I wonder if I'm the last to know. At any, <laughs> at any rate, it was a good idea, and it's uh, now a 53-year-old marriage. Um, the, uh, the environmental rally that I was fortunate enough to be part of was um, something that it's difficult to reconstruct in today's world. It was a thoroughly bipartisan affair. The vote uh, on the, I've, I've forgotten what the votes on the Clean Air Act were, but in that same 50 years, the uh, president declared on New Year's Day that the 1970s would be the year of the environment, and it was. The Clean Air Act was passed. In that phase, that period of two or three years, endangered species, coastal zone management, which I had written at uh, the White House, um, other regulations for the environmental impact assessment under the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, safe drinking waters, clean water followed. At any rate, a whole spate and wonderful things happened on the land. I think it was something like a tripling of significant parkland protections in the next five to eight years. And um, the saving of San Francisco Bay, it would have been filled in if it had been business as usual and that was accepted. And then finally, most astonishing at all, the saving of the California coast, so that today it looks as it did then, a remarkable defiance of market trends that otherwise would have prevailed and made it look much like uh, many other developed beachfronts around the country. All of those things happened in a relatively short period of time. And I recently had lunch with the first EPA administrator Bill Ruckel's house, and we talked. He, he he talked about his amazement that, in that era, he could not propose enough. He could not ask enough money. He could not have uh, enough encounters to talk about the wonderful things he wanted to do. Because that's the attitude that the Congress had. That's where the country was, and it followed that. Air emissions declined very significantly over that period, even though we more than triple the number of automobiles, the contribution of automobiles is vastly reduced. I actually love the fact that in 1991, after the Clean Air Act I was involved with um, was passed, the Hemlock Society issued a directive not to rely on the cars manufactured after 1991 for uh, anything that might uh, be associated with uh, the purposes of the Hemlock Society. At any rate, um, after, after that era, and it lasted, it lasted at least until the Arab oil embargo, uh, we had a united country is what we really had. We had a sense that, uh, I remember when, when I was early in my office at the at Council on Environmental Quality, I was the fourth hire, I was handed a memorandum from Judge Burns, federal district judge, in joining granting of the permit for the Trans-Alaska Pipeline. You cannot imagine what a blockbuster that was. And it was printed, failure to comply with the Mineral Leasing Act of 1920, I think was the first paragraph. In his own hand, failure to comply with section 105, 5022C, what was it, 
one, I think 1022C, uh, anyway, environmental impact assessment requirement. And from then on, uh, the Council on Environmental Quality had an enormous clout because we were the reviewers of the adequacy of procedures. I was in charge of transportation department and interior department and some others, and we parceled them out. And um, the extraordinary thing historically is the two Senate sponsors of the National Environmental Policy Act, Senators Jackson and Muskie, were totally blindsided by the court's use of that statute to block a major public works project. They didn't see it coming. Hard to believe in litigious America that they didn't anticipate it, but they didn't. In fact, they had previously been touting their role in its design, and then they began to say, but actually one, one section, now well, that was Jackson's, or that, that was Muskie's. So it, it made huge history, and I think it reflected the fact that the judges decided to take it literally. They decided that the rate at which we had altered the environment and had corrupted it in so many places, whether it was the Great Lakes or the Great Rivers or the air in Los Angeles and other places where it was egregious and you could see it, had gone on long enough. I was invited some years ago, just about three or four, I guess, to go to China and advise the Chinese on the creation of a new environmental protection agency. And I finished my speech to the people who actually were gonna write the regulations and their statute. And uh, one of them stood up and said, how did you get the states to pay any attention to you, Mr. Riley? They pay no attention to us at all in Beijing. That's counterintuitive for Americans, but that's what he said and apparently true. And I said, well, I could cut off highway funds. Well, what else? I could go to the courts. They were strong supporters of the statutes. No. Um, we had newspapers and the press followed assiduously the developments in the environment, the problems, the terribly photogenic pollution, and then the correctives. No. <laughs> then I went to NGOs, needless to say, that, that didn't carry it away. But there was a young woman from WWF China, and she stood up, she said, Mr. Riley, you might explain to them some of your voluntary programs, green lights, energy star, uh, 3350 3, uh, toxics reduction program of, of lawful toxics, but uh, below the level of regulatory concern that companies would volunteer to, to reduce. And so they said, well, what did you give to those companies that corresponded, that responded to 3350, for example? I said, uh, a flag to fly over their plant and a very nice letter from me. And uh, they turned to one another and they started getting excited. They said, that could work. And they later created a thousand companies which would voluntarily commit to significant reductions, particularly in sulfur dioxide, a major problem there. And uh, it has since become 10,000 companies. And how they get compliance when they don't have statutory authority to do some of these things, you know, I don't need to know, but they do. Anyway, um, but what those questions reminded me is, is what a magnificent collaboration, the achievement of those laws represented. Greg Easterbrook, a fairly fine writer on things environmental, has said that the environment is one of the two great achievements of social policy in the post-war world, the other being social security. It was a success and it was a very big thing. There is a lot more to do and not all the news is good. I listed some things that uh, are not so great and, um, and set them out. We've lost three million birds. We've lost uh, something. We have a million likely extinctions of species in the next few years. We um, have um, a whole range of, of contaminated areas that uh, still have to be developed and have not gotten any attention. I can remember that, um, uh, however, that should be offset. And I, I really want this to be a positive contribution tonight because it's a very positive thing to have 50 years here and have the kind of distinction that you have. The um, next really big thing that I think of was the Green Revolution. <laughs> 
and I had a privilege of being in the company of the architect of the Green Revolution, Norm Borlaug. I say it was so big because I was interested in international development when I got out of law school. And the three big, two big challenges were to feed India and China. And there was a real question. Some of you may remember the population boom by, or bomb by, by Paul Ehrlich speculating, not speculating, prophesying that uh, India would not be able to feed itself. Well, actually, it also occurs to me that Borlaug was a gruff fellow, and he said uh, he was really mad at environmentalists the day I was with him because they had blocked DDT from being available to do things he thought were very important to do in the developing world. And he said, you know what I say to them? I say, let them eat tigers. And I thought, well, I see why people remember Remember your little pithy comments. <laughs> Another memorable comment was made by Admiral Rickover, famous admiral in the Navy, who was coming out of a meeting we had on ocean dumping once and said, if this nonsense continues, I won't be able to spit in the damned ocean. At any rate, personalities had a lot to do with what we did. Nixon, particularly, was a complex personality. He uh, foresaw 68 in 1968 when he was going to run for president that the environment would matter. And the reason he saw it was the three issues of major concern to the American public, according to polls then, were the war in Vietnam, the state of the economy, and the environment. And he said to his people, John Ehrlichman and John Whitaker particularly, get out front on the environment. And when he took office, he had a yellow pad and he, he wrote about 10 issues and he drew a line under four, and he said, these four issues I want to be in everything that moves. I don't know what they were, one can speculate, but the environment was among the next six. And he said, I want us to have a distinguished record on the environment. I don't need to be involved unless I do need to be involved. If I do, call me in. But uh, that was enough to get us support for some of the statutes that we, that we had, and some of which we even crafted ourselves. It was a very productive time. I recently upset Bill Ruckelshaus by concluding a chapter that I've written on Nixon and the environment by saying that, quite simply, Nixon was the most consequential president for the environment in the post-World War II era. And uh, Bill wasn't very pleased about that. I think his tenure as FBI director, which caused him to, way before anybody else knew about them, to listen to all the tapes, left him with the feeling that uh, whatever else he did, was offset by, um, by, by misbehavior. At any rate, there is another very big thing that we have recently done. We have done, foundations have done, the Gates Foundation, and oh, and both, by the way, before I leave altogether the Green Revolution, the Rockefeller Foundation spent 40 board meetings. I have served on foundation boards, the Packard Foundation and others, and I know what an achievement this was. 40 board meetings without any progress on the research and development of the Green Revolution until finally it broke, and they did. The patience, the persistence, the generosity, very considerable that resulted in that huge breakthrough. My great credit to, uh, to the foundations and just as like the Ford Foundation, what we have heard. But the other great thing that has involved foundations as well, particularly the Gates Foundation, but quite a number of others, is in international development. It has not received very much attention. I had a conversation with President Obama about it once, and I said, you know, the country doesn't know that over the past 15 or so years, beginning with George W. Bush and the PEPFAR on AIDS, millions of lives have been saved in the developing world particularly. A reduction of half of the childhood mortality has occurred. Major incidents of malaria have been cut down. Polio went one from one year from 300,000 new cases to 30. Dehydration went down. What clean water was made available to more than a billion people, and sanitation was as well. This is an achievement of extraordinary value and significance. And it's our own government, uh, both presidents, George W. Bush and Obama, and um, the Gates Foundation, which particularly targeted marijuana, uh, mar I want to say marijuana, no, I don't think they did, actually. <laughs> uh, and, and as I say, it, it deserves to be recognized, and we, we ought to, it, hasn't, it isn't done. There's an awful lot more to do. 
And as in the future we, we face two major transformations, I think that it's important to recognize that we have this capacity, we've exercised it before, but the country has to have confidence and care and enthusiasm. I honestly question whether we have that right now. The professor of history at Harvard, Jill Lepore, has written that in the 60s, up until the 60s, it was common for major historians to write the national story. They then began to write very distinguished research, but on pieces of our national history, and typically on, on major problems, persistent problems, of race relations, um, female emancipation, uh, treatment of Indians and Indian tribes, and a whole range of essentially, um, well, essentially problems that they identified, contributed to solutions for, and we saw all the various revolutions that we saw following the environmental revolution. But in the process, the historians of the sort that Hofstadter, for example, represented, or Pearson, um, or Bieber, or several others, um, they neglected to write the national story. And the national story is exceedingly important. She made the point that if you don't write the national story, don't think that it won't get written. It will be written, and it is being written, and it will be one of uh, victimhood of, by trading partners, a betrayal by some, um, hordes of immigrants organizing at the borders, um, basically a beleaguered kind of view or idea of the country, when in fact the liberal idea is a very different one. I don't think that we are seeing the national story written now, and I, I, I saw an evidence of this in a, in a conversation I had, well, two conversations, once in New Delhi at a conference on water and energy, which I was speaking. And at the table, I was seated with Henry Kissinger, and um, you remember Henry Kissinger. Henry Kissinger has had that marvelous formulation for solving al almost any problem. He said, your choices are nuclear war, utter surrender, or my idea. <laughs> at any rate, he leaned across the table and he said to Lee Kuan Yew, who was also at the table, the head of government of Singapore, he said, can the Chinese keep this going? And Lee Kuan Yew said, yes. And Kissinger said, I'm a historian. There's no precedent for it. And Lee Kuan Yew said, well, the Chinese are different, but they have made a strategic error. They have sent their children to American universities where they will acquire the American democratic infection. That was probably 15, 18 years ago. I then asked Dr. Kissinger last spring whether it had worked, whether the students who had come had acquired American ideals and values, aspirations. He said from what he knew of his granddaughter at Harvard, we were the most misogynist, colonialist, oppressive country in the world. And it struck me that that is kind of an illustration of the preoccupation with our problems, which while it can be perfectly constructive, it can also be disproportionate. And if you're looking at the American experience, and you think about the common characteristic which is most salient to, I think, most people who, who look at this country, and certainly those who come from others to us, it's, what is it? It's success. That is what this culture has been. That's what your school has been. So I want to say to you, I really respect what you've done. I think that the importance of law, of the procedures, of respect for process, which uh, in my generation was, was uh, lampooned more often than not. We were very proudly anti-authority. At least we like to pretend we were. We weren't, though. Um, it's never been more important. And the kind of people who speak to those values and speak to them confidently and inculcate them in students, I think do a marvelous, priceless job. And I compliment you for it, for having done it for 50 years. I was gonna tell another story, but I don't remember where it fits in. Uh, <laughs>
uh, it's a story, another story of Li Kuan Yu, who um, had a conversation with Deng Xiaoping, leader of China. And Deng Xiaoping was quoted by Li Kuan Yu as having said, no one could compete with China. He said, we have more than a billion brains. And Li Kuan Yu reported that his answer was, yes, they can. America can. Because they'll have seven billion brains they can draw on. He was looking at our open immigration laws. Well, um, I recall uh, a moment in the hearing on John Roberts' candidacy to be Chief Justice of the Supreme Court when he was asked uh, somewhat portentously how he hoped that history would remember him. And then he answered, well, I, I hope it will report that he got confirmed. <laughs> and uh, I, I, I thought of that as I, I thought of myself and um, all of the aspirations that people have and the kinds of lawyers that they, they aspire to be and how little I knew when I went to law school where I would end up or what I wanted to do. And I think of the phrase by Harold Macmillan when he was asked, how did you set your priorities? He said, events, dear boy, events. So this is a nice one. Enjoy your success. Thank you. think I put them to sleep. <laughs> no, I think they're ready for questions. Um, welcome everybody um, to our celebration. Thank you for your remarks and um, the next phase of our evening is we've got some questions for you about mm -hmm. environmental law and sure. your thoughts looking back and looking ahead and um, we also have opportunities if anybody in the audience would like to write a question on a card we'll collect those up here and save some time toward the end. Um, to read some of your questions as well. So I think uh, Rob is going to kick us off with our first one. Okay. And we'll go from there. So uh, Bill, you've given us a, an overview of, uh, of the 50 years uh, in which we've had environmental law in a meaningful way in this country. And you've told us about some of the uh, 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 activities that you were involved in as well as some of the success stories. I wonder if you could elaborate on what you see as the most significant accomplishment in environmental law over the, its first 50 years in this country? Well, if you, if you took, as we often do, lives saved, deaths averted, morbidity, mortality, um, it would have to be clean air. Clean air uh, is, and we, we, we know this, so I have very good reason to believe it. The first thing I did when I became administrator, and I resolved to do this when I was still at World Wildlife Fund, was to ask the Scientific Advisory Board, a very distinguished body, uh, by the way, the current or most recent occupants of which have all been fired, but notwithstanding that, um, I asked them to, to clarify, to select for me the major threats to the environment and health of the American people and the ecology, because I intended to give a higher priority to ecology, and to what extent does the budget of the Environmental Protection Agency conform to your priorities? Well, they put the five criteria of pollutants right at the top. Also, not incidentally, they put climate change in that top list and the destruction of um, estuaries and, and, and wetlands. Those were high. Second order problems, they said, were hazardous waste. Well, at that time, two thirds of the EPA budget went on hazardous waste, Superfund and mm -hmm. Resource Conservation Recovery Act. So I would have to say that the combination of the Clean Air Act of 1970 and the strengthening uh, reauthorization and, and amendments to it in, in 1990 are probably the, the things that have made the most difference in the lives of most people. All right. One of the things we've noticed um, in thinking back is that not only are we in our 50th year, but EPA is coming up on Everybody its 50th is. year. Everybody is. Clean Air Act. Yep. Exactly. And so we wondered if you could say a few words about EPA, the, the institution, and 
Um, what you see is the institution's most significant accomplishments in the past 50 years, and then looking ahead, um, what do you think it needs to be doing as an agency going forward? Well, uh, Ruckels has believed, no, Train, who was the second administrator and my mentor, very close protege, believed that it was maintaining the commitment of the people of the United States through the embargo, the energy problems, the inflation now, the malaise of the Carter years, so many reasons to be distracted, but the country wasn't. And I remember when I took office, uh, the president's pollster said uh, between 82 and 84, five percent of the public reports a very strong commitment to the environment. And he said that led him to convince President Bush, George H.W. Bush, that the environment has entered the core values of the American people and it's not been dislodged. And I think EPA had a huge amount to do with that. I think Ruckel's House and the other administrators did as well. The integrity with which those laws were administered, the fact that they were by and large free of scandals. That's, there was a period when two years when there were some, but uh, they corrected for it. And um, I think the agency has had a great run. I worry now that um, we look ahead uh, without I was extremely fortunate to have a president who cared about the agency. He came over to swear me in. That had never happened before. And uh, I, I don't know if it was to EPA or because he liked to dance with my wife, but he invited us to five state dinners too. <laughs> Seated her next to Prince Philip, next to Václav Havel. At any rate, um, going forward, I would like to see EPA take possibly the leading role in the formulation of infrastructure development that will be necessary to arm our cities against floods and sea level rise. Now, some people might be surprised, a regulatory agency will just look back at the period when the agency deployed two and a half billion dollars a year on wastewater treatment plants. It did that, again, without scandal, without problems, without disruptions. It, somebody needs to do that. One can imagine how different agencies would go about it. The sensitivity to the environment, to doing it in a compatible way, promoting green infrastructure, for example, rather than just fortresses. I think all of that is something that uh, with environmental values that are inculcated in that agency, and it's a marvelous agency. You know, I, I remember discovering early on that there were many more Peace Corps volunteers at EPA than in any other department of the government. Well, you think about that. People don't go in the Peace Corps to make a lot of money or to, or to, uh, you know, realize uh, great uh, recognition and ambitions, but they're really devoted. And I think that agency is. And I hope that the present period, which is not one of high morale at the agency, is one that uh, a lot of people power through because we'll need them. Sure. So one of the most significant changes in environmental law and policy uh, over the past 50 years is the growing emphasis on need to deal with climate change. I know that when I started teaching, climate change wasn't on anybody's radar. It wasn't part of my agenda. And now virtually every environmental law class that I teach, even if climate change is not the specific subject that's uh, on the table that day, I'm bringing in news items that, uh, that, that uh, illustrate uh, current events concerning climate change. So I wonder whether uh, you could answer a couple of questions concerning climate change. First of all, what do you see as the most effective approaches and the most promising approaches for achieving greenhouse gas mitigation? And second, you began to address this a bit in response to uh, Emily's last question. What legal changes do you think need to occur in order to promote effective climate adaptation? Well, adaptation and mitigation are, are two sides of the same coin. For a long time, it was politically incorrect to talk about adaptation because it thought in, in the eyes of a lot of environmentalists that somehow that was acquiescing in a process. Well, the process is upon us, and uh, I am presently dealing with climate change personally. Uh, the fire, the Kincaid fire, is about five or six miles from my house in Healdsburg, California, and that's climate change. The, um, th there's so many things that need to be done together. I, I, would, I would say two things, and rather than looking at the technical things. The technical things are pretty obvious. The electrification of the transportation system, new construction across laminated 
wood construction to reduce the amount of cement and concrete and steel that we're putting into big buildings. Uh, that's, that's something that I just heard about within the past year. It was invented 10 years ago and it's, it, it's doable. You can have very large buildings made of wood. Um, the electrification of transportation, but also the, the strengthening of the grid to support all of that and the gradual movement even over, certainly out of coal, which is still close to 30% of our supply, but um, even out of natural gas within our lifetimes. I think that's going to be necessary. And a whole range of, of those kinds of measures. But what we have first to do is convince the public that these things are necessary. And we haven't succeeded in doing that. And I've been impressed by the importance of language in approaching people about climate change. Um, Catherine Hayhoe told about finishing a lecture in Texas. She's an astrophysicist in Texas. And someone came up to her. She had just spent the whole lecture explaining the consequences of the changes that were going to occur and that were already occurring and measurable, the glaciers and all the rest. And a woman came up and says, I'm so glad you're not one of those climate change people. And the woman had no problem with the discussion that she was in and the kind of measures that Catherine was talking about even. And, uh, and I remember I was involved in the largest private equity deal to, up to that time. We bought Texas Utilities, the biggest utility in Texas. And in explaining it, uh, some of the people who'd done focus groups said, don't mention climate change, even though we were canceling eight new coal-fired power plants. Talk about energy efficiency. Talk about energy independence. Talk about wind. Texas has, still has far more wind than any other state, even California. Talk about solar. Well, you can get there if those kinds of things are acceptable are parts of your future. And at um, any rate, I think, I think that's, a, that's a task. She has said she's a Canadian, and she never met anybody in Canada who didn't believe in climate change. In the first 10 years she was in Texas, she never met anybody who did. <laughs> One of the things that we have to be thinking about, even as we think about climate change, is the other environmental issues that we face, um, perhaps more locally or mm -hmm. um, on other scales. And I wondered if you could say a few words about what you see as additional important environmental issues going forward, um, in addition to climate change. Mm -hmm. What else should we be thinking about? Well. I wanted, when we finished the Clean Air Act, to take on Mr. Dingell and uh, Mr. Byrd, who were the two uh, largest uh, opponents of it, again. And uh, I recently asked Senator George Mitchell, I said, if we had gone ahead with uh, two other statutes, there are two other areas of concern, clean water, which really needs revisiting, and um, climate, greenhouse gas reductions, could, I have, could we have beaten them again? And he said, I don't think so. However, he said, I didn't think you'd get clean air. So it would have been nice to try, but Senator Chafee, who is a very good friend and in ranking in the Environment Public Works Committee, when I told him I wanted to, to take up clean water in a serious way, he said, you'll lose it. You'll lose the powers you have to veto projects. You'll lose 404. That's unhappy. This Congress wouldn't give it to you. And um, I think the risks are much too large. So I didn't, but it still needs doing. Could you elaborate? What would you do to the Clean Water Act? Well, I think the measuring and monitoring of, um, of soils has reached a capacity now that you can do with drains. I have a, a farm that I inherited in, from my dad in central Illinois. A, I said drain, drones. Um, you can monitor in such a way that if you do the right things about how you plant and use of cover plants and setbacks and things of that sort, but also <coughs> monitor very carefully um, how your water situation is, is in, a, in a farm. You can impact on the huge burden of soils that are carried down the Mississippi and all of the alluvial rivers, the, the feeders to the Mississippi that have created the dead zone in, in the Gulf of Mexico. And I recently was looking at some of the people who are most disadvantaged. They're Vietnamese fishermen, it turns out. They, they fish in shallow waters. They're crab and oyster fishermen, largely. But that's 
that's a need that I think we now have more technology than we've ever had before. And I, I ask people, is it conceivable we will get the technology that can also look at nutrients in the soil and measure nitrates? Uh, I'm told that we don't, but there are people working on it. But that's a breakthrough that would be marvelous. We have to have regenerative agriculture. I didn't mention that in terms of a very important contributor to the climate resolution. And we know how to do that. I'm not myself entirely comfortable with the examples I've seen that seem to be a little more labor intensive than America is. But uh, we've got to figure out how to produce productive nutrients for people without um, doing the kinds of things that agriculture has exacerbated in the environment, and, and there have been plenty. Thanks. Sure. I'm going to ask you a process question. So you spent uh, some time telling us about the uh, spate of legislation that Congress adopted in the environmental decade, starting with NEPA and really ending with the Superfund statute and everything in between, including some natural resource management statutes like the Federal Land Policy and Management Act and the National Forest Management Act, all adopted in the 1970s. It was a remarkable set of accomplishments that occurred. But really, the last major piece of environmental legislation that Congress adopted was the bill that you ushered through Congress, the 1990 Amendments to the Clean Air Act. So we're going on um, decades worth of, of relative inactivity on the part of Congress. And there are some who say that our system is broken, that uh, we don't have a functioning legislature anymore. At the same time, you have courts, in, in some cases, environmental and otherwise, uh, who are inclined to construe grants of statutory authority to administrative agencies narrowly, and indeed to perhaps even limit the amount of authority that Congress is capable of delegating to agencies. Mm -hmm. So if you have Congress not willing to or able to enact environmental policy measures and the agencies being hamstrung in the ways that I mentioned, what do we do? Where, where can we expect environmental, positive environmental policy to come from? Well, I can tell you how it all plays out. I recall there was an issue when I took office of the onboard canister versus the oil tank control. And uh, the issue was there are large amounts of emissions that were escaping in the refueling process for ordinary cars. And one view was that the oil companies should deal with it by putting some recapture devices on the pumps. The other view was the oil company view that no, the auto industry ought to deal with it. They ought to build canisters that are inside the car. So the uh, administration favored putting it on the pumps. I didn't believe in that at all, but I lost on that one. I, I didn't believe in it because Washington was doing it, and I always smelled the reeking fuel odor when I refueled my own car. Well. So we took the position we took, and I found myself in front of the chairman of the Environment Committee, Senator Baucus then, and he was furious. He said, you defied the plain statutory law, black letter law. It says, the administrator shall ensure that the onboard canister is required of automobile manufacturer. And I said, uh, yes, it does say that, Senator, but you haven't read the whole sentence. No, he said, it's very, it's clear in your face, it is. Well, the rest of the sentence read, after consulting the transportation department with respect to the safety of the device. I said, I did consult the transportation de department. They said it's unsafe. <laughs> so what was I to do with that clause? Even though actually I was kind of on his, uh, more than kind of on his side, but that, and I, I laughed and finally, he got more and more upset and I finally said, Senator, we both know what happened here. Mr. Dingle got the oil company uh, to worry about it, to protect the automobile industry from it. Mr. Waxman got the reverse. They each got a clause. That's the way statutes are often written. And that's the way administrators often get them. So it's very easy then to blame the administrator. You're gonna have half people thinking, people thinking you're wrong anyway. But that's why I, I, I find it almost laughable to think that Congress is supposed to anticipate and act in a different way than it always has by giving us much clearer, much more precise, much more specific statutory directives. First of all, they don't have the expertise, typically, uh, and to the, time, to the extent that they, they acquire it, um, they probably don't have the time. So these agencies have been 
have been constructed not because people believe in big government or want to uh, see more more of these um, more personnel hired by the government. They've been they've been hired because there's an extremely complex process. Each one of the industries regulated for clean air has its own set of priorities, problems, technologies, and histories. I remember in, in enforcement, I tried to get, uh, get our people to be much more focused. I said, look, we have 18 years of history here. We know who the bad guys are. Let's focus on them. And we had the most vigorous enforcement record in the whole 18 year history then. More people uh, fined and penalized and many jailed. Um, but let's not waste our time. And if we have people who think that they have better solutions than we do, let's, let's listen to them. And we did. We found reforms that, uh, that we could accept from industry, cheaper ways to achieve the same kinds of things. Well, all of those kinds of things are necessary. Uh, they're not going to be made easier by Congress deciding that the powers need to be limited of the administrative agencies who are interfacing with these problems. I often wonder, by the way, if the people who, who, who articulate that kind of concern, uh, if they have any street experience. <laughs> I wonder if we could shift over a little bit to, to international issues. Mm -hmm. And um, you've, we're familiar with some of your background um, involving U.S. leadership mm -hmm. in, um, in the international space around environmental protection. Um, and now we see perhaps um, a retreat from some of that leadership. And wondered if you could speak um, to the impact of shifting U.S. policy with respect to international environmental law and, um, again, looking for ways forward given that landscape. I was in Germany last month to try to convince them to get out of coal earlier than they intend. They intend to do that by 2038. Astonishing to me that they've still got something like 38 percent of their capacity in coal. and. They now recognize, I think, that at least privately, that the decision to get out of nuclear, which supplies 22 percent, as I recall, of their, or at least 20 percent of their um, electrical capacity, was a mistake. It was, it was at a minimum very premature, but they're stuck with it. Uh, they didn't make their Paris objectives of 40 percent reduction in greenhouse gases by, or won't make it by next year. So their solution is to say we're going to get 50 percent, 2030. And I, the case I made to them was um, the Montreal Protocol was a fabulously successful international agreement with measurable results. Uh, it was led by the United States against a very reluctant Europe. Europe wasn't ready. We were. We had the advantage that DuPont had man manufactured the substitutes. That really helped a lot. And they were willing to go. I remember talking to the Chinese minister uh, at a conference Mrs. Thatcher had. And I said, do you not accept the science? He said, well, we consider that it's awfully convenient for you who uh, have these substitutes now, but we don't. They were going to manufacture 10 million refrigerators containing CFCs. Would have blown away much that we did in the rest of the world. Um, but my point was that a statute, not a statute, a treaty, particularly like Paris, which has no compelling enforcement mechanism, needs a champion. It needs a nation state to lead and guide and cajole and harass and all of that, all those things that, that countries can do. Well, it's not going to be us. I mean, we're going to withdraw. Can't be Britain. They're totally distracted by Brexit. When I was in Germany the first time, I've been gone twice in recent months, the uh, Gilets Jaunes were rioting in the streets. Mm -hmm. And so it's not going to be the French. I said, it has to be the Germans. And you always were the greenest of the major countries. And privately, I was told that it won't be us because uh, our two major political parties are hemorrhaging votes. We're very worried about populism and, and the AFD, the right, right wing party. Um, we have lost confidence, Amer Germans, in elites, particularly including scientists. I heard this from scientists. I, was, I found this all, well, it sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? Um, and I, so who's left? I mean, it, it, China might like to, to lead on it, but China is doing the Bel Belt and Road, which is uh, replete with coal-fired power for places even that haven't had that much of it, like Pakistan. 
So I'm not sure I have an answer to your question. How, how do we exercise a leadership, which people do look to America for? And I'm, I must say that my understanding is that the behavior and the contribution of the State Department officials, and drawn from some other agencies as well, at the conferences of the parties, the implementation element for the, for the Paris Agreement is very uh, constructive. They are focusing on exactly what they should focus on, on um, transparency, on equivalence, on measurement, on monitoring, on reporting, on all of those things. That's where the attention needs to be devoted right now. But one would hope that given the time since the last, since Paris, countries could look at how much farther they could go. And I honestly think that we're not in a good position if they don't even achieve the goals they set themselves. That's the thing to keep in mind. This is a treaty, it's not like Montreal Protocol where they were set nationally and everything was come down 50% and then to be completely eliminated. So if you choose your own objectives, you think, well, maybe you ought to make them. But it's not gonna happen, it looks like. So I, can, I don't have a lot positive to report on that. You've discussed some of the uh, improvements that uh, we've experienced as a result of uh, the Clean Air Act in terms of air quality and the Clean Water Act in terms of water quality. But there have been sources of both air and water pollution, perhaps other kinds of pollution as well, that have kind of been, uh, I would say, third rails in terms of our efforts to, to deal with them effectively. And so I'm thinking about um, non-point sources under the Clean Water Act uh, which Congress has been extremely reluctant to attack at the federal level because it seems to involve land use regulation, mm -hmm. which is regarded as a prerogative of state and local governments. And in the clean air area, I'm thinking about uh, individual use of motor vehicles. And so every time Congress, including in the 1990 Clean Air Act, has tried to basically force states to more effectively deal with individual consumer use of cars, by, for example, encouraging mass transit, um, increasing bridge and toll uh, uh, um, amounts so that people are uh, induced not to drive. It hasn't worked. Uh, it, it's been politically impossible to get those things accomplished. And I think most people would say that the largest remaining source of water pollution are the non-point sources. So what, if anything, do you think can be done to get us to the point where we're willing to, or at least the politicians are willing to, address those, those third rails? Well, on the non-point non source issue, that's why I referred to the, uh, to the measurement of, of water, of um, basically the character of soils in the setbacks and the cover crops and all the rest that I hope will characterize regenerative agriculture, or even if it doesn't, those techniques are, are fully associated with industrial agriculture. Um, what you do for mass transit, I suspect, um, it, I suspect we're likely to do better with a democratic house than we might have otherwise. Um, but as far as getting people to use their cars differently, I mean, we're getting a lot cleaner cars. That's certainly true. And I think we are going to move forward with electric cars. There, um, I remember I, this whole California waiver issue has arisen in the news, and I granted nine waivers in my four years to California, mm -hmm. including one that would have required 10% uh, of all new, newly manufactured cars, in California at least, to be electric. And I said in that statement that we at EPA did not believe that that was a practical thing to do, that the infrastructure wasn't there, the refueling and all the rest, recharging. And it turned out that was correct. But my philosophy of the waiver was, well, California got the waiver authority because it had the most egregious problem. And it had been the most imaginative and innovative state and cities, particularly Southern California, in coming up with solutions, offsets, and a whole range of other things that originated there. So I think that those kinds of, um, and now we're, now we're fighting to keep the waiver as a state. You, you, know, you may know. I didn't think, by the way, you could reverse a waiver because one theory behind the waiver, you think, you think about it, uh, if, you're, if you're giving 
different regulatory requirements to the auto industry, which is what a waiver does, and typically stricter ones, presumably you want to give them reasonable notice that they need to redesign their engines. So for that reason, I would have thought once a waiver is granted, you've got to, at least for the near term of the, it takes to redesign those engines, you've got to allow it to play out. But um, I've learned a lot in the last couple of years. It's, uh, I didn't think it was true. You've mentioned local government. So, I, I'm, Rob, I'm going to take our questions out of order and um, shift over to the role of local governments in addressing environmental issues. Um, could you say more about um, what you see that role being and whether you think our legal framework is adequate to support that role? Well, I really do believe in local government action to address a lot of these problems. And I, I use an example that annoys my brother and son-in-law who works on energy efficiency in New York when I cite Chicago. But Mayor Daley, who was not known to be a passionate tree hugger, shall I say, in 1996, got educated by Kyoto. He called in the authorities from the universities and their considerable universities in Chicago, and he said, what is a prudent course for us in the face of the changes you anticipate for this city? And they said, um, you should stop planting ash, maple, and spruce in your parks. 2,200 new trees are, parked, are planted every year. You should replace them with a different, now that you're in a different plant zone, or you soon will be, with Alabama sweet gum and that we should have a much larger canopy of trees to shade the city. We should have white roofs to the extent possible, as they're famous for. Um, we should increase our emergency room capacity by threefold, at least, because uh, we're going to have probably 45 to 50 days, summer days, above 95 degrees. Historically, in the last century, the number was 15. Our uh, water will have to be uh, conserved. Uh, they designed their own uh, porous pavement, permeable pavement. And they said we would be getting water in Chicago, much like California does. That is heavily from November through uh, April or so, and then nothing from May through October. And um, all of that has, oh, and then it, the school should be air conditioned. I don't, know, I don't know if they've done that. They've done a lot of the other things I mentioned. They're, that all of that was done without rancor, without political divisiveness, and it was very constructive. This is, this is the answer to the question, what should a prudent government do to prepare for this future? And other cities have done similar things in recent years. I think Chicago was the first major city to undertake <coughs> things of that scope. Mayor Bloomberg uh, did a lot of uh, very impressive things along the same lines. I, I was always fascinated. As I went to urban planning school when I got out of the Army. And uh, his chief planner told me that he looked at the city of New York and he saw um, six boroughs, the five and the seashore, which he treated as a separate entity. And I can remember in 1992, coming back from Rio, I took a little cruise down the East River and the entire Brooklyn side was given over to waste, big dumps, big cars and everything else. And um, you go back now, and it's, it's bucolic, it's beautiful, it's uh, packed on Sunday afternoons with street fairs and food fairs. And um, one of the piers has something like three full-size soccer fields on it and a lot of other playing fields. It, it really remade, and much of, the, of Manhattan has been improved, the Manhattan coast as well. Those kinds of things need to be coordinated with green infrastructure. That is the amount that you're going to cede to the sea level rise when it comes, because it is coming. They're, they are building a seawall along the Wall Street and North area, but um, those things will cost a fair amount of money. There's consensus obtainable for that. Uh, people contradict me sometimes, saying that, in fact, one of my one, one of the questions about the big ideas was it took 42 years to build the, was it the Second Avenue subway? <laughs> so <laughs> I, I thought, you know, I said, I go to China a lot. Uh, you might hire some Chinese. At <laughs> <laughs> any rate, um, I think there are many cities that are now strongly committed 
to getting a grip on the climate issue, and certainly the California cities. I took off during the last big snow uh, uh, soot storm in California, unable to see Alcatraz or the Bay Bridge, for those of you who know San Francisco Bay, taking off from San Francisco International Airport, which is quite close to the, to the Bay Bridge. And I thought, well, this is really what climate change looks like. And we had air pollution that was as bad as New Delhi's in San Francisco. It's a marvelous jewel by the bay. So that's, that's our future. And uh, I am trying to give some advice to PG&E at the moment, but uh, wondering if, if they're going to turn the power off for hundreds of thousands of people every October. I don't think that Sonoma will have a robust economy. I was associated with a company that had a call center in Southern California. They moved it to Kansas because five to seven days they were being shut down by hurricanes. The frequency of storms had increased so much. Uh, I know that Swiss Re is now developing a new mode of risk assessment because they've been relying too much on historical precedent. But the whole point about what's happening now is it has no precedent, not in human times. At any rate, the cities, I think there, are, there were 131 of them at some point that were all signed up to the same kinds of measures. And they're significant measures. And they can make a difference. They can't solve the problem. But they can solve a lot of the associated difficulties that will come. Uh, maybe your, your uh, company should have talked to me. I lived in Kansas for 27 years, and I can attest that uh, extreme weather events are not unheard of in Kansas either, so <laughs> uh, they may have some downtime there as well. Um, I want to return back to uh, the, the 1990 Clean Air Act amendments for a minute. Uh, so I think everybody uh, who knows the legislation would agree that one of the most innovative, if not the most innovative aspect of that piece of legislation was the incorporation of an emissions trading program in the acid rain part of the statute. And economists um, and some conservative politicians had been urging greater reliance on market-based mechanisms since probably the mid-70s. And it finally came to fruition in the acid rain uh, title of the statute, and I think has been emulated since then in other contexts, both domestically and internationally. What we, and, and at the time, I think many uh, environmental NGOs were skeptical of the use of, of emissions trading because they thought it would um, perhaps facilitate e evasion of, of um, meaningful compliance. Since that time, I think we've seen a, the situation flipped on its head, where today uh, the environmental NGOs are, I think, strongly in favor of use of some kind of emissions trading system to deal with greenhouse gases. And it's been the conservative politicians who are opposed to uh, that kind of program. So I guess my question is, first, what do you think accounts for the flip-flop of those <laughs> in favor of and against uh, greater reliance on market-based as opposed to traditional regulatory approaches? And second, where do you see the future of market-based regulation going? Well, market-based regulation proved itself in the acid rain program with the Clean Air Act. It just did. We dealt with acid rain. The, the amount of acidity in the lakes now in the Adirondacks and other areas of the Northeast is much, much less than it was. The number of species of fish and others that have come back to that area, the whole ecology is much restored in, in important parts of the country. And it was uh, getting impaired. We didn't, we didn't have a catastrophe, but we had a serious problem, and we took 10 years to deal with it. I know the Germans, when they decided to deal with their acid rain problem, they simply ordered scrubbers and gave people three years to put them in. So there were different approaches to it. But we chose the market-based approach. And it, uh, it won Republican support, that along with the performance standard on, on clean coal. The previous law had required that the sulfur be removed, 90% of it, from, from coal. And that was essentially to protect the coal of of West Virginia and up to Illinois, whereas the Powder River Basin coal from Wyoming and surrounding states was, all, was vastly cleaner. And there was no reason to ask that 90% of the sulfur be removed from it. It was uneconomic to do that. 
Well, if you remove that requirement, if you simply set a standard that, that sulfur couldn't be more than a certain level and everybody could just figure out how to meet it, that meant that Powder River Basin coal would be sold and marketable. And that brought Republican senators and Congress members to support the Clean Air Act. And that's what surprised Mr. Dingell and Senator Byrd. They never thought that we could do that. There's no reason why whatever you attempt to try, as long as it's not something like toxics where you don't want to tolerate any measure of it, that uh, that shouldn't work again. And I, I don't think it's so much that the members of Congress are against that kind of approach. The Republicans are quite proud that they cooked it up, or at least they, they, they initiated it. Uh, it's that they don't want to recognize the significance of climate and they're not prepared to do the kinds of things that they anticipate it will require. I think that's, that's really what's going on there. It's also odd to me that, um, that the issue became so supercharged when, and, and I often wish that even if we had not been able to get it passed in the law, it would have been very helpful for a Republican president with the stature of George H.W. Bush to have espoused a reduction in greenhouse gases. I mean, he did from a, from a moral point of view by signing the Convention on, on Climate Change. But to go further uh, during our watch, it might have defanged the issue a little bit and removed the uh, tribal character of it. A lot of theories about how that developed the kind of energy that it, that it has. But it, the peculiar thing now is I, someone said something about uh, a secret vote in the House would produce something or other. Well. I have been told more than once that there are at least 100 members of the House, Republican members of the House, that fully get climate, but, but uh, would lose their primary election if they were to support. I was told this specifically about Waxman-Markey, which was the climate bill. And uh, as long as there is the kind of very strong opposition to it, Somehow we, we need to recast it, and there are certain groups that simply, I think, need to be more engaged in it, which I would start with evangelicals. I'll uh, shift to a few questions that the audience have provided. Sure. And um, this one, um, I think, follows on our discussion of, of coal and mm -hmm. um, power plants in particular. Well, one of the things the Clean Air Act does, of course, is I mean, grandfathers, um, those, those plants that were existing um, from some of the, the upgrading that mm -hmm. would be required of new plants. And um, so the question is asking um, how you would address that kind of issue, um, grandfathered plants, or you know, we can imagine lots of right. other um, stranded resources. And do you think that market forces are addressing that, um, to follow up on Rob's question, or do you think we should be doing more? Well, I think market forces are, are dispatching coal. They, they really are. The, um, it just can't compete with, uh, with natural gas in, in most mm -hmm. of the country. Uh, there are some new, newer coal-fired power plants which possibly can for a time, um, just given the amount of sunk cost in them that needs to be amortized. But um, I think it is a problem that is taking care of itself. I mean, we've gone from more than 60% of coal capacity down to under 30. And we've done that relatively quickly. The investment I described that we did in Texas uh, went bankrupt because of uh, our failure to anticipate that the gas, which was $8.30 when we went in, was like $2.20 when we, when we came out. And we had too much coal was the answer. So I think that part of the problem is not so serious. It'll be more difficult to move against natural gas, which is a relatively clean fuel. And one will have to really understand the urgency of our, of our predicament. And probably something of a crisis will have to have occurred to cause the country to come to that conclusion. And we'll also have to see a continuing development in the capacity of, of wind and solar to, uh, to win favor in places that they haven't. And I was surprised to see in Germany, there's a lot of resistance to wind power. They just uh, don't like the sound of it, don't like, uh, and the visuals. And I've never understood the visual part of it. Of course, in Texas, that's never an issue. There's so much, there's so much land. Um, 
but that's the direction that we're going to have to go. And it won't, it won't be easy everywhere. In India, and I, I co-chair with John Podesta the Track 2 India-US climate program. And uh, an Indian friend on that, on the Indian delegation, said, you know, he said, um, it takes a huge amount of land to get solar to make a contribution. I think for 120 megawatts in Texas, which we were building when I left the company, what would you, what would you guess it would take? takes 2,000 acres. I, I was astonished. And, and then it requires water to keep them. And if you're in a dusty environment, and my Indian friend was saying, he said that one place that has that kind of land is too dusty. We, we don't have the water to keep those, those panels clear and, and clean. So none of these problems is going to be without effort. And we'll learn things along the way. But there are promising new technologies. And there has to be a technology that can take the carbon dioxide out of the air. We need negative emissions. I didn't even understand that probably seven or eight years ago. I only began to learn about it. There are companies, it can be done technically. It's not impossible. It's hugely energy consumptive and expensive. A lot of people have invested in it. Gates has invested in it, among others. And uh, George Schultz, the former Secretary of State, has a program at Stanford I'm part of that every two months we have a uh, meeting on one of the emerging technologies, and we bring in the company founders, the people who've designed systems and so forth, to explain how far along they are. Well, they're not that far along, but they, they are at work on the right problem. Can I have follow up on that question, Emily? So you talked about the role of natural gas, which is quite controversial. There are some people who think that we ought to get rid of it, stop using it, because after all, it's production and use results in emissions of greenhouse gases. Um, and uh, there are methane leaks at some natural gas production facilities. There are others who think that uh, natural gas is a bridge fuel that we need to be relying on as we phase out use of coal. Uh, and then there are others who think that if we get rid of natural gas, it's going to be counterproductive because it will re reinvigorate the coal industry by making it more economically competitive. How do you think we ought to think about those I agree kinds with some of issues? That. Which, which part of it? <laughs> I, I agree that um, we eventually will have to get rid of natural gas, but we would be crazy to do it before we've eliminated coal. That's what I really believe. And uh, once that has happened, um, I don't know what the people that are subjecting to it think that we are in a position to replace it with, but we're not at this moment. Uh, renewables are not making a significant contribution to aggregate energy capacity in the United States. They're just not. I mean, it's, it's growing. It's growing faster than percentage-wise than, than um, some of the other uh, fuels. But, but you don't just decide to shut down your combined cycle natural gas plant, which is a very efficient operation, uh, and, and, and say, well, you know, what am I offered now? So it's not that easy. We haven't dealt with the intermittency problem either. I think there, there are reports of battery projects of um, progress that suggest that we might be able to eventually have batteries strong enough to provide the power that we need through the night and there's no sun or through the windless era uh, times. But uh, we're not there, there yet either. So you, you still, I, I remember being surprised that you've still got to have a th about a 35% capacity even as you put all your renewables in to deal with that very problem, a 35% non-renewable capacity. Um, another question um, from the audience. Um, you mentioned the environment being a bipartisan issue, at least for a time period. Mm -hmm. And the question asks whether you see the environment becoming a bipartisan issue again, and, and if so, how? Yeah, I sure like to say yes to that question. <laughs> Um, you know, uh, one of the things that uh, one of the things that seems indisputable is that when people, members of the Congress, say, "I go home to my district, and you tell me how serious the climate problem is," and I have a Q and A with constituents, it's never brought up. It's not that urgent uh, uh, an issue, and it's certainly there's plenty of evidence. It's not a not typically a voters voters issue. Anybody familiar with the Environmental Voter Project? Mm 
it, it's a fabulous organization that takes the public records of who voted and who didn't. And that's just public, you can find out. And they also take some records that they have from, I think it was Pew Foundation, about the people who consider the environment among the top three issues of concern. And they talk to people, they go out there, they're mostly, as I recall, targeting younger people, because younger people don't vote. And they talk to people who are millennials, there are 12 million of them who didn't vote, and uh, every one, according to the president of the Environmental Voter Project, says, oh yeah, I vote. <laughs> but it's quite clear they didn't. <laughs> and uh, reminded me of when, when I was in office, the Surfrider Foundation and Surfriders supported Bush for president. And this surprised the network people. So they went to interview them and they said, oh, we love EPA and we love Bush and really. And um, guys, you know, he, he's got his board over his shoulder and he's about to go in. And so he said, well, uh, who, who did you vote for last time? Why, why, why are you for Bush? Well, we used to get sick because there was a pulp and paper thing. EPA shut it down. They dealt with the problem and we don't get sick anymore. And so uh, he said, well, who'd you vote last for last time? Well, I, you know, I, I, actually, I actually didn't vote, honestly, last time, but, but I'm gonna vote this time. Well, what about time before that? Well, you know, I never voted. <laughs> this is on national television. Up until then, I thought I was gonna get a copy of this and show it to the president. And I thought, no, I guess I don't. <laughs> but but the, the Environmental Voter Project identifies these people who are going to vote the environment who never voted before, and it touches them five times. It, there's an interview, there are emails, they get them to sign something promising that they will vote in the next election, even if it's a city council election, just to get them in the habit of thinking about voting. And they purport to be able to increase by two to four percent the turnout in any constituency. And the marvelous thing is that even if it doesn't cause the environmental candidate to be elected, it will cause the person who is elected to realize there is a constituency in my district for an issue that I wasn't paying attention to, and next time, and perhaps a reconsideration of posture. Hey, we look for it. I'm, uh, I'm uh, raising money for it. Sounds good. Sounds good. Another question that we received is um, to ask you whether you find the argument um, around there being a fundamental right to a clean and healthy environment. Do you find those compelling arguments? Um, I wonder if you could say a few words about. You know, I've always been a conservative about declaring rights to this and that. I remember when we were entitled to a decent home and a suitable living environment in the, was it the 1968 Housing and Urban Development Act? Well, has everybody got one? And where should they go to pick it up? I mean, I don't think it's responsible to create rights without responsibilities for servicing those rights. So I'm not sure what it would mean practically. It might mean more activity for lawyers. Uh, and that might be good. It might be good to focus on if that, if that is an avenue to get governments to do more, to be more active and aggressive on clean air. I'd be open to listening to those arguments. But I think that uh, one wants to be careful not to contribute to a cynicism about, uh, about laws and apparent rights that don't result in any, in any <coughs> noticeable change. Okay. All right, we have our final question. Okay. And um, this one also comes from the audience. Thank you all for these questions. Um, this one asks about what you think um, are the key factors for ensuring environmental policies that endure? Well, you know, I would say some things that we, that we don't now have, but we did have before. And I, I think, as, well, as I reflect on it, maybe we do. When I said that we have more than 80% of the pub public supporting clean air and clean water, you have not seen, even among people who would be sympathetic to it, a frontal assault on either of those statutes. That says something. They're reading those polls. So even though people may not be voting those issues now, they might be exercised and energized to vote if something significant were done to put them in danger. I think that what we want to do <clears throat> ideally is to move the, the unfinished business 
of the environment, the really significant issues that remain into that nexus of uh, core values, as Teeter Polster put it. And that, I think, will get done over time. I think the moment for climate being taken very seriously will come, and you will get the kind of competitive politics that we had in the early days of the environment with people wanting to take credit for initiatives in the area. Practically speaking, I think there will be a lot of responses that will not be acknowledged as responses to climate. I mean, there's certainly plenty of people uh, who are looking at the fires saying, well, we've always had fires in California. We've not had fires like this. But um, that's okay, probably, if the kinds of solutions that are developed are practical and effective. Well, you've certainly set out, um, I think, an agenda for all of us um, here in the NGW's program. Thank you so much for being here with us. Thank you to all of you for coming. Um, to Rob for, for co-meeting. Uh, Thank you for great questions. Doing the program. This, yeah. is, this has got to be the calmest. Most. <laughs> it's the ducks. <laughs> it's the ducks. Everybody I, is swimming. I, I believe it. I've never had an audience so, so silent. This is, uh, I, I hope that I, you know, you're, you've been wrapped. That's what I hope. They're spellbound. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Thank you so much.